the concepts apply to everyone, whether you're a leader or you're running, you're actually a lead of your own business, which is yourself. You're a lead of your own personal brand. So unless you um, are hyper aware and seeing what's going on around you, you'll be like my dad. And then one day after 30 years, they'll just say, look, see ya, pack up your bags and go. That's 30 years. And it was just like that. Yeah. So if you're not, see, my dad didn't see it coming. So he wasn't hyper aware. So that's, everybody needs to be hyper aware, execute at speed, make good decisions, engaging, visionary, adaptable and humble. Hi friends, welcome to the Sydney Professional Development Forum or PDF. Uh, my name is Washington Shod and I'll be the moderator for this event. Uh, PDF was established to help diverse young professionals find fulfillment in their workplace. We are volunteers who believe that everyone should have access to the knowledge, mindset and network to become the best version of themselves. Uh, just before I start, just a bit of housekeeping. Uh, please note that this is a recorded session that you'll be distributed via social media in the near future. Also, I would like everyone to update the names and turn on the camera so we can better connect with each other. If you have any questions, please put them in the chat box at any time. You will also have an opportunity to ask questions directly towards the end of the session. And lastly, feel free to join our LinkedIn page to get the latest updates and posts on many different topics by our team. Uh, link will be on the chat box. Um, a brief introduction to Bruce Mullen, our uh, guest speaker tonight. Uh, for the past eight years, Bruce has been provided consulting services to dozens of commercial, public, aged care, disability, and community organizations. He has guided business transformations by radically changing business practices, implementing new technology, and introducing new ways of thinking. In his spare time, he facilitates the SMRC Leaders Lab program, uh, teaching essential leadership skills within diverse communities, and is certified volunteer mentor if the mentor remains charity. By the way, uh, the biggest killer of men aged between 15 and 44 years is suicide. For every life saved, 200 people avoid lifelong sorrow. So Bruce, along with his daughter, Phoebe, ran Dead Daughter Charity events to raise awareness and funds to prevent male suicide. Um, all right, Bruce, the stage is yours, mate. Thank you. Hey, look, yeah. it's really great to be here. So you'll see up on your screen, um, a diagram and if you can draw that diagram now you'll be ready for an upcoming activity so let, let's get started so thank you for that wonderful introduction Washington and all your support to get here I think we spoke last year and and you know since we've opened up here in Melbourne um, everything's just moving so quickly now and the time has gone so far so thank you for this opportunity to PDF which is a wonderful organization so tonight we're going to cover the how to future proof your career and we'll talk a lot about the future of work but the four things I'll cover that um, yeah, I've got a lot of content the four things I'll cover will be everyone has a superpower what is a career anyway on getting a mentor and future proofing you so let's get started so I've got a, quite a bit to cover and you'll be able to ask lots of questions at the end. And, and perhaps as we go along, I'm not sure. So everyone knows this already. We're in the fastest transition of how we work in human history because of things like digitization, automized, automa automation and artificial intelligence. But what's also changing is the expectations of employees and community standards. So you'll know there's been a lot going on about what type of behavior is expected in the workplace now and what employees are expecting from their employers. So it's not just a technical revolution. There's a lot of change around what people are expecting to get out of work and what the community expects work to be like. So all of this change going on, how can it all work in your favor? So this is me. 
I was born in 1969 in a place called Dampier in the original mining boom. Now, I came all the way to Melbourne in the early 70s. And in 1981, my work life started when I had my first job as a paper boy. I was delivering afternoon papers. That's back in those days, we had two papers, one in the morning, one in the afternoon. And they're about, depending on the day, they're about an inch thick compared to how big the papers are now. Then in 1984, I got my second job, which was working in a nursery watering plants. And then I got my third job, which was in a local hardware store, serving and stocking shelves with customers. And that was in 1986. In 1988, I took my gap year and decided to go traveling. And I started off in Alice Springs and I traveled up to Mount Isa, the back of Queensland, down to Brisbane, back to Melbourne. In that period of time, I think I had 18 different jobs, including unloading a wheat train, working in transgender bars and working in convention centers um, as a waiter. Then in 1993, I had my first child, Matthew. Uh, he was born. And then in 1990, sorry, 1993, I got married. 1996, I had my first child, Matthew. And then in 1999, I had my second child. And by that stage, I would probably had about 10 years of full-time work and I had a degree in accounting and finance. So I was 29 years old at that time, which is where a lot of you are now. So I was thinking about life at that time. So one of the things I wanted to share with you was Sylvester Stallone. Now there's a video on the bottom right hand corner. If you click on that link, it'll open up a video and I encourage you to watch that video. The reason why it's important to me is Sylvester Stallone told the story about how he created the character and the movie Rocky. And the reason he did it was because he didn't know whether he could act, but he wanted to fail on his own terms. Which, which resonated very, very strongly with me. So in 1999, I took a huge risk. I had a newborn baby. I had a three-year-old son. And I decided to take the whole family to New York um, to work in America. And uh, that was the start of my journey. Then in 2002, I'd been working for a few years um, across North America in Los Angeles, New York, um, Dublin, um, and London and then um, we made a decision maybe in 2003 or four to come back to Australia. So then in 2006 I'd been working, I'd st I was still working overseas but based in Melbourne and then I had a conversation with my father and I asked my dad who was 68 at the time, I said dad he's 68 what would you have done differently in your career? And my dad said to me, I would have taken more risk. So I said, what do you mean by that? He said, well, I would have gone out. I would have done some consulting. I would have tried different jobs. I would have taken a few things on. I, I spent 30, over 30 years at the same company. At the end of that time, all they did was make me redundant. And then I had to start all over again. So then dad said he would have started his own business. So, so I took that advice on and that's when my first business started was 2006. But the thing my dad didn't tell me was how hard it is to run your own business. So then in 2013, after seven years of um, having my own company, I really hadn't grown. It was just really me I'm doing some consulting contracts. I then decided I was going to have a real crack at it and start hiring people, start marketing, start building a sales pipeline. And then by 2017, I had six people working in the team, plus myself, plus some admin people. And we were absolutely flying. We had, uh, I think we had 10 projects going on at the same time. We had people working on two or three projects. It was going really, really well. I thought it was going to go forever. And then by 2019, it had all stopped. All the projects finished. And uh, my last employee left at the end of 2019. 
And then after 2019, we all know what happened. We had COVID and here we are in 2021. So that's my working career. So I got to hear now, what would I, what have I learned along the way and what lessons can I share with you about what's coming up over the next 20 years? Well, the first person I want to introduce you to is a fellow by the name of Arthur C. Clarke. Now, Arthur C. Clarke wrote about global satellite TV of hundreds of channels. He wrote about mobile phones. He wrote about online banking and online shopping in the 1950s. He wrote a book called 2001 Space Odyssey in 1968. That was made into a movie. And if you watch that movie and you look really closely, you'll actually see a precursor to the iPad in that movie. So he was what's, what is known as a futurist. And he certainly did inspire men, inspire others to dream about what the future might look like. And of course, the people will say, ah, oh, you know, the robots are coming. There's going to be no work for anyone. What am I going to do? Well, my answer to that is 20, 30 years ago, we didn't have an IT industry. Now the IT industry employs so many people. So it's just, it's not that there won't be jobs. It'll be that we don't know what the jobs are that will be here in 20 years, but we know what won't be here. Or we're guessing, we can take a pretty good guess. So let's take a look at what happened in the 60s. We had these things called the Daleks. Uh, they were our first robots that we had up on the big screen. And then in the 70s, a movie called Westworld came out. So we've had this idea of robots looking like humans ever since the 1940s. Then in the 1980s, one of my favourite movies, Blade Runner, came out with replicants um, who, who had feelings. In the 1990s, we had The Terminator. And then in the 2000s, iRobot. And then in 2010, we had the remake of Robocop. So we've fictionalised all of these robots for the last 50 years. But what's happened now? If you look at a company called Boston Dynamics, you will see the future is right here, right now. So again, I've got a little video for you to watch. Watch that later. But these robots are already in service and being used by the military for different tasks, particularly the dogs, because they um, deactivate bombs. And they can enter enemy territory um, without uh, the danger to human life. So the robots are here. So the secret for you tonight that I'm going to share with you is, is that the robots are already here. They're already working. They're already taking jobs. Amazon will have a fully automated warehouse before too long. The whole supply chain will be fully automated. Facebook already know everything there is to know about everybody. Um, so the horse is bolted. On the other side of this is that we do have the opportunity to create our own futures. And with the technology that's available now, the future has more possibilities and opportunities than ever before. So in Australia, we, we have an annual event where we have thousands of backpackers come over and pick fruit. Well, we've got robots to do that now. In Rio Tinto up in Northern WA, we used to have truck, we used to employ truck drivers, but we don't employ them anymore. In America, there's a there is a company called Katira who are building houses, custom houses, in factories to specification, they ship them to the site. So rather than have a carpenter and a plumber and an electrician, they just have people that install houses. So the whole model of building a house, the old you know two before and nails, has been completely overturned. So who's at risk here? Who who should be worried? Well, according to this research from The Economist, that if you're a telemarketer, you've got a 0.99, which is a 99% chance that your job won't exist in 20 years. 
But if you're an accountant, you should be worried. And the reason why is that there's technology now that can read invoices, they can classify transactions, they can create a set of financial statements without any human intervention. So there'll be an ICFO. Retail sales people, real estate sales agents, technical writers, um, and particularly people who prepare contracts like lawyers, a lot of that will be automated and it already is. Word processors and typists, they went a long time ago. My first job, we had a whole room full of people who were sitting at, the at a typewriter every day, typing day in, day out documents. All they did was type. And those jobs don't exist anymore. And that was in the early 90s. On the other hand, the good news is if you're a dentist, you've got very, very little chance of losing a job in the next 20 years because we all need a good dentist and they can't get replaced by robots. But I think I might become a dentist. What do you think? So that's an example of what's going on. So let's look at some, some real stats from the Australian government. So on the left-hand side, we've got the most biggest sectors in terms of percentage of who's employing who. Our biggest sector is healthcare and social assistance, retail trade, professional scientific and tech services. That was, that's what I was talking about. It's all those IT people. But construction, accommodation, food services. So they're the biggest sectors we've got. Incidentally, mining does not employ that many people, yet it generates a huge amount of income because we sell it all and it goes overseas. So I'm calling that 2020 BC because that was before COVID. So on the right-hand side, you can see that we've got the last 20 years, how these proportions have changed. So you can see that healthcare has gone up by at least 50%. You can see that professional services have gone up and construction has gone up. But manufacturing has died. It's gone down by almost half. And farming and fishing has gone as well, almost half. So that they're the sectors that are declining and the growth is in health and healthcare and social assistance. So that's where our future, a lot of our future lies is in helping an aging population over the next 20 years, because we're going to have the biggest number of people over the age of 100 in 2045 that we've ever had. So, you know, where does it leave you guys? What do you think the future is going to look like if all these jobs are going to be disappearing? If you've got an accounting degree, like, what are you going to do? So don't call me and say you didn't see it coming. All these companies were impacted by this future of work phenomenon. Blockbuster got beaten up by Netflix. One Three Cabs got hit by Uber. National Geographic, a paper-based magazine that was one of the, the most popular subscriptions in the world a bit like encyclopedia britannica got overtaken by wikipedia kodak yahoo dick smith i used to buy my records from tower records toys r us just went bust last year so let's look at how do we defeat the robots how do we have our own superpower so that we can take on the robot, robots and beat them. So one of the biggest challenges of, for everyone in the workplace is what are you good at? Now, the generalist knows a lot about everything. So here's some of the things that I know things about. Financial systems, projects, small business management, operations, health and human services, financial services, coaching, blah, 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 blah. list goes on. My point here is that I've got all this knowledge in my head, but the world is not looking for generalists. The world is looking for somebody who knows a topic inside out and can work in that space and can be the best in that space. And I'll, I'll explain a little bit more about that as we go along. 
So the concept is that a fox knows many things, but a hedgehog knows one important thing. So let's practice this ourselves and let's see what it looks like if we were to do this ourselves. So grab a piece of A4 paper and draw this diagram on the paper. So it's a big circle in the middle and you've got four quadrants. So just take a minute to do that and I'll give you a minute to prepare that if you haven't done it already. It's funny that we're in the technological age and I'm asking you to write on a piece of paper, but hey, it's gonna work. Okay, so everyone got their piece of paper ready? So you should have a piece of paper that looks something like this. So the, in the top left hand quadrant, write down a three or four things that you, are nat that you believe you're naturally good at. So just three or four things. So that's the first quadrant. On the right hand side, who do you like to work with? What is your ideal work environment and how you like to be treated? So in that quadrant, write three or four things down that, that appeal to you in terms of who do you like to work with and what your ideal work environment is. And in the bottom left quadrant, write about some things you are deeply, deeply passionate about. So when the best way to figure out if you're passionate about something is I'll ask you some questions. Think of a time when you're doing something that got you so self-absorbed that you forgot to eat. What were you doing? Think about your childhood. What did you love to do in your childhood just for fun? For me, it was Lego. I played Lego, I think, every day of my childhood. Or I climbed trees. And another question for you to think about passion is, how much are you prepared to sacrifice to stick with your passion when times get tough? So in the bottom left quadrant, write down some things that you're passionate about. Then on the right hand bottom quadrant, have a think about who, what kind of job or who might it be that might pay you for those three things. So if you have somebody that would be prepared to pay you, who might that be? And what sort of role would it be? So write down those four things. Now, what I'm going to show you, the reason why the circle in the middle is empty right now is because what you do is you pick, you cherry pick a few things from each of the quadrants and you put it into the middle, you combine them and that becomes your unique superpower. Just like Superman, he can fly and he's bulletproof. You can have more than one superpower. But let's just create one for now, something that you want to be known for, so that in this 20 year future coming ahead, that your personal brand can carry you forward by having a superpower 
that the world needs. So for example, for me, my, I'm good at maths. I'm highly analytical. I love finding patterns in chaos. I love creating practical designs. I love measuring, I love scheduling, and I'm always asking questions. So they're my things, they're my strengths. So my, on the other side, who do I like to work with? I like to work with smart, a smart person who's got a plan, a person who gives me space and time to think through and solve problems because the problems we solve are deep. They're not something, you know, if you go into an organization and they've been doing the same thing for 20 years, it's not gonna be a five minute uh, workshop to solve that problem. It's gonna require some deep thinking to work out, you know, all the implications and how you would change the way that organization works. I like people who are stable. If people aren't stable, uh, meaning that they're highly emotional, um, they're hard to work with because they get upset easily, they get angry easily, um, and it's hard to have conversations with them, and it's hard to know when to approach them, when not. Um, and I also like people who are trustworthy because um, trust is very important in, in any relationship, and work is just another form of relationship. Um, and I like people who are aligned with my social values and ethics. So I would never work for an organisation like Crown Casino. I would never work for Philip Morris Cigarettes. I would never work for organizations like that because I don't believe in the products and services they're offering are aligned with my own values. So what am I really passionate about? One of the things that's really cool for me is uh, particularly with either coaching or data analysis or any of the work I do is finding and illuminating the truth so that people can achieve their potential. So, so particularly with coaching, it's always looking for that ruby in the mountain of rocks, or it's looking for that thread of gold in someone's situation that's not working for them and helping them find that little gold nugget. And that's their starting point to moving forward. So in terms of who might pay me? I might work in quality assurance or I might be a, I'd love to be a forensic investigator. Um, business analyst, analytics, business process uh, measurement. Um, I might be a psychologist or I could be a project leader. Or I could be an economist with all of those things. Now, one of the tools that I use to help me figure out, you know, what my strengths were and who I like to work with and the conditions I like to work in was a tool called the Berkman method. And I'll show you a little bit more about that in a moment. But the reason why I've got things highlighted in red is what I wanted to do is to pick those four things out and say, those four things collectively become the personal difference because my superstar power statement might be, I help blah, 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 achieve what, because why? So by taking for those four things together inside the circle, you create the statement as to what those four things come together and mean. So a statement might look like something like this. I help time poor dentists, because we all know that there's gonna be plenty of dentists around, make brilliant business decisions each and every day to keep their patients smiling. So I might be helping dentists with running their practices. But because I've niched myself down, I'm known as the guy that just helps dentists. So when a dentist talks to another dentist, they go, just give Bruce a call. He helped me and he knows all about dentistry. So the concept of having a superpower is so critical that people will talk to each other about you. If you're a generalist, you it's hard because a dentist is going to say, well, I don't really want some bloke who doesn't know anything about dentistry dentistry coming into my practice and helping me run it, right? So it's that kind of argument. So the best way I can explain it is to say to you that if you've got a leaking tap, you will call a plumber. You won't call a generalist. 
because you know the plumber has got the skills to fix your tap. You're not quite sure about the generals. He could fix the tap or she, but you just don't know. So if I'm going to procure some special services, I, it's, if you're a generalist, it's going to make it really, really hard. Um, and a lot of people do MBAs and they're a generalist degree as well. They give you a good all-round understanding for management uh, and a career in management could await. The challenge would be for people like me, MBAs aren't that useful because people don't ring me and say, I need somebody who's got an MBA. I need somebody who can fix a leaking tap. So here's some resources for you. So the Clifton Strengths Finder from Gallup is a really good tool. You could probably cost you $40. You can do an online survey and you can get a really good understanding of where your strengths and superpower is. There's a book by Gary Keller called The One Thing and The Berkman Method is what I described earlier. So you can search up, see if you can find yourself a Berkman consultant who can provide you with the, with the, the assessment and debrief because that would be worth every penny. The beauty of the Berkman method is it was, it was developed for the US Army for, to understand how people work under pressure. And it's got some really, and it, what it does is helps you work out what you're good at without pressure and what happens when there is pressure, where do you go to in terms of your strengths and weaknesses? So it's really, really helpful. And Jim Collins, good to great. That's the hedgehog principle about the fox knows lots of things about everything, but the hedgehog only knows one thing. And that is a really good book as well. So what is a career anyway? Well, we have been talking about this whole thing. The last, probably the last 20 years has been about work-life balance, but now it's more about work-life integration. We're doing more work at home than we ever did before. And also work and life, the lines are really, really blurry now. In fact, it's almost to the extent where it's just life because we spend so much time at work. We meet so many people. We socialize with people from work. Is it really just part of life? That's just a question. So, so the way work will work in the future is that people will come together and form teams that will solve a particular problem. Here we got a, an example of, you know, six people coming together to solve a particular problem. Now it's good to see the Wiggles get back together again, but the goal here is to articulate that each person has a special skill and that skill when combined solves that particular problem. So the challenge with groups like this is generalists aren't that helpful because what we need is we need a crack group of specialists that can solve a particular problem, come together as team players and then disperse and then reform in a different group as a self-organized team to solve a different problem, but using their specialist skills. So I'll give you an example. If you wanted to build a house, you'd bring together an electrician, a plumber, a tiler, an interior decorator, all of the different trades would all come together to help build the house. So you would have a project manager or you would have a builder coordinating everything, but you'd have your sparky, your chippy, your plumbers, etc., all coming together. They all do their own thing, but they all do it really, really well. So you wouldn't have your plumber do your interior design, for example. So that's another example where the way the world is working with the gig economy and the knowledge economy, we're going to be bringing together with people with very specific skills. Solve a problem in a short period of time, ungroup and then regroup. So, so one of the other things I wanted to talk to you about was being a niche juggler. So here's a few of the things that I do. Um, so I've got my practice, which started in 2006. I do dad, daughter, charity quiz nights, as Washington mentioned. And also um, got my new practice, which started just before COVID came, which was a strategy and coaching practice. Now these, these are all niches and I've got a B2C retail business as well called Mullen & Co. 
and I joined Mentoring Men just earlier this year. So as a mentor, so those are five things that I do that are all pretty much niche. And this is what's known as a portfolio career. So I've got, so some of them are voluntary. So the dad daughter charity events and mentoring men are all voluntary, but the other three are income generating. So there's a concept called the interim manager. It's a thing, it's not that mature here in Australia, but it is very mature in, in the UK and also in America. And an interim manager uh, is somebody that is almost like um, a contract executive that goes from organisation to organisation. It might be to run a project, to do a merger. It could be somebody's retired. They need some, the CEO's left suddenly. They need somebody to fill that spot. And then from there, um, they have a one year contract and then they move on to the next contract. So from my perspective, in order to balance income versus these side hustles is having this interim manager roles. And I'm currently doing one at the moment with an organization to help them transform all of their people systems part of their business. But at the same time, I've got these side hustles going on. And the reason for that is, is if, like my dad said to me, he spent 30 years at an organization and then one day they came in and said, you're finished, you're done, leave now. So if that was ever to happen to me, I've got all these side hustles at different degrees of income, different degrees of complexity, are all running along on the side. Um, it's not the end of the world. And that's what's really important in this new economy is to be flexible and have those multiple income streams. So here's some more resources for you. And if you, as I can show you here, if you click on some of these, there's a link to those particular organizations. So you can, uh, Watermark is the specialist in interim recruitment in Australia. I think they're the major um, player in that area. That's all they do is do interim recruitment. Um, and a couple of good books, Startup, Know When to Quit Your Day Job, and Entrepreneurial You from Dory Clark is how to create multiple income streams. It's not that hard. You know, with all the technology we've got today, we can stand up a side business in a weekend and have it generating revenue the following week. So what kind of cars do interims drive? Well, not them, I can assure you. It's not that simple. Um, that's more like it. So in order to be successful in running your own business, You've got to be prepared to stick with it and it will take a long time to build that trusted audience that will buy from you. It's not going to happen overnight. You might think Jeff Bezos was an overnight success. It took him 10 years to get even get Amazon off the ground to where it is. Start off as an online bookshop. Um, Elon Musk. Um, they all took years to get it going. Even Apple took many, many years for it to get to where it is now. It started in 1976, Apple, and um, the Max came out in the early, early 80s. So a couple of things that would have made a difference in my life was get, would, would have been to getting a mentor. So we hear about this 70-20-10 rule, and that's a rule about learning. So we learn 70% of what we know from being on the job. We learn 20% of people from... 20% of what we know at work from the people around us, uh, peers, coaching, etc., And 10% of it we learn in formal training sessions. So I spent all of my career on the 70-10 and I would have liked to have spent more time in the 20% range because by having good mentors means you can make better career decisions. And I'll show you a little bit more about that later. But the focus of this section is really on that 20%. And that 20% is so critical. And a lot of organizations put too much emphasis on the formal training and therefore people have to su survive and learn on the job. They don't give them any support. So the guts of being a mentor is it's a form of teaching. So it's understanding what your role is, technical and business issues you might face, how to build relationships, professional and personal development. 
So mentoring is very different to coaching. So coaching is about performance. A coach need not know anything about you, your role, your challenges, and how you work. There's a men so a mentor needs to help you with technical and technical and business issues you face, right? Whereas a coach doesn't need to know what the issues are. Because what the coach does is helps you solve your own problems. But a mentor would say, hey, yeah, I know what that is. I've had that before and this is how I solved it last time. So a mentor is more about being there, done that, and I bought the t-shirt. So, and, and by the way, here's my biggest stuff up. So that's what a mentor does. So this is a bit of a train wreck and this is a little bit of some people's careers. They go off the rails every now and then. So this is my three big stuff ups. So in 2003, I had a question, should I continue working in New York or come home? Because my wife wanted to come home. 2011, my overseas contracts ended and no one knew me here in Melbourne because I'd been effectively been overseas for 12 years um, and I hadn't worked locally and that made it really, really hard. So that would have been good to have a mentor at that time. And 2017, I was working seven days a week um, and I didn't quite know whether that's what business owners are meant to do. And uh, as it turns out, I wasn't working on the right things. I wasn't working on the pipeline. I was just working in the business, not on it. And by 2019, it had all finished. So they're my three big stuff ups. So mentoring isn't helping you find a job. Mentoring isn't fixing problems you ought to fix yourself. It's not counseling. It's not a, ca a casual coffee chat. It's not a short term thing. And it's not a free ride to the top. You still have to do the work. A good mentor would get you to do the work. So the best mentees are actually mentors. So what I recommend is become a mentor. You can, there's a whole lot of youth organizations where you can mentor. There's, your work might have a mentoring program. One of your professional associations might have, your, have a mentoring program. Just two things to look for. One is, does the mentoring program provide training? Because that is essential. You just can't walk in and mentor someone. It's really helpful because there's a lot of models and a lot of techniques you can learn about mentoring. And you can become a mentor. Um, so the other, uh, yeah, it's got to be a structured program with a clearly defined period of mentoring and what the goals of the program are and have some structure around how you collect information about each other and um, achieve goals so that's really important there's some resources again if you click on any of these it'll take you to those organizations and you can have a look at them so the last thing i wanted to cover is future proofing you with aq aq is your agility quotient it's the new thing it's come after eq which was your which was emotional intelligence so unfortunately um for me that the agile, so the agile project management framework uh, hijacked the word agile. So when everybody thinks here's the word agile, they straight away think of software developers sitting in a room, uh, busting out code in in rapid rapid time. But in fact, the word agile means the ability to move quickly and easily. Now, if you think about the new world that we're in. That's exactly what you need to be able to do. And you can only do that if you're flexible, if you can see opportunities, and if you are open to moving. So I one of my things uh, that I teach is around agility. So this is um, a young fellow, he's three years old. He's part of Mensa. He's the youngest member of Mensa in the world and the Mensa group measures IQ and IQ is uh, a measure of intelligence. So IQ as, as a measurement started in 1905, various iterations, but it measures certain types of intelligence, not everything. 
But previously, the smartest people were hired because they had an eye, high IQ. Then what happened in the, in the late 90s, this concept of emotional intelligence came on, which is, which is where management thought, well, IQ, EQ, EQ is more important. So just being smart is not enough. You need to be able to regulate your own emotions and, and have a sense of what other people are doing. So emotional intelligence came out in the early 90s and was popularized in 1995 by Daniel Goleman. It's been around for 25, 30 years now. What's come out in 2017 and uh, probably in full force in 2019 was this concept of AQ, which is agility. And as I mentioned, it's got nothing to do with the project management methodology nor software development. So the seven capabilities of AQ, uh, firstly, it's humility, adaptability, engagement, and visionary. So humility is being able to accept feedback and recognize that others know more than you do. Adaptability is accepting that in disrupted business environments, the change is constant and changing one's mind based on new information is a strength. Visionary is having a clear sense of long-term direction and engagement is about a willingness to listen, interact and communicate with everyone, both internally and externally. So those, they're the four behaviours on the outside. On the inside is we have executing at speed, hyper-aware and making informed decisions. So hyper-aware has been constantly scanning to know what's going on for opportunities and threats. Make informed decision is using data and information to make evidence-based decisions where you can. And executing at speed is moving quickly to implement often valuing speed or progress over perfection. So they're the three capabilities. So four behaviors, three capabilities. In fact, the strongest out of those seven is in terms of where people rate themselves is making informed decisions and where organizations are the weakest, it's in fact executing at speed. So because we've been able to measure all of these skills and attributes of both teams and individuals, the top three strengths in organizations are pretty obvious. Their technical ability, working hard, and being action-oriented. They're the top three strengths within organizations from an agility perspective. The top three weaknesses are interesting. It's challenging poor performance. That's number one. A lot of managers don't challenge poor performance. Uh, the second one is tough, making tough decisions. A lot of managers do not want to make those tough decisions. And that's what's holding them back. And the third one is really, is really well, a lot of you will recognize in, in your workplaces is where you've got very poor role models. And they're those leaders that behave badly and don't show the others how to lead. So you've now got a sense of the future, we'll be looking at those seven things. So you can learn more as well about that. So a couple of things I'll finish up with. Um, purpose, courage, and faith. So these are the three things you will need to take you through your career, whether you're like me doing interim work with some side hustles, whether you're running your own business or whether you're a general manager, or whether you're a CEO, it, it doesn't matter. They're all the same. So first thing is, there's only two important dates in everyone's lives, the day you were born and the day that you realize you were born. And the day you realize you were born, that becomes your North Star or your purpose or your reason for being. There's a concept called Ikigai, which is something you can look up separately. But that's the first thing of these three is to figure out what in the world you're doing here. And that will help you. The second part of it is courage. Now, courage, this is the cowardly lion from Wizard of Oz. 
the courage to me um, is now called vulnerability. And to me, they're the same thing. Because back in, in my day, it took courage to speak up and to say that something wasn't right or not working as it should be. Whereas in today's world, by calling things out, you're actually putting yourself in a vulnerable position. So it's actually been called vulnerability now, but in my day, it was courage. And I still believe that it takes courage to speak up, to do, do those wonderful things that's happening, that's changing society's expectations about people should, how people should behave in the workplace, the Me Too movement, et cetera, et cetera. I won't go into that here. So that's really, really important. So the courage means you're going to take a chance. You're going to take risks. You're going to have a go and you're going to have a crack and you want to fail in your own terms. So you need the courage to do that. And when you get lost in all of that, it'll be your purpose, your reason for being, which will bring you back and take you back to where you need to be to keep moving forward. And the third pillar is perseverance. This is the Mars rover, but perseverance and faith. So, so even though things may not be working out for you, you can still keep trying and still keep moving forward. So the most important thing is to keep learning and keep trying because you will get there eventually. Now, the whole, the whole notion of the having the faith to keep going and to keep trying is that's because when everyone else is saying this is not going to work or the data is telling you that this is not going to work, you've got something based on your beliefs and your courage to, to keep going and you'll get there. So perseverance slash faith is the third pillar of a successful career. Not that I can say I've had a successful career per se because we're in the moment now, we're, we're all there, but that's what I see. Um, and there are no guarantees in life. So if you want a guarantee, you might as well go and buy a toaster. That's Clint Eastwood. That was one of his famous quotes. And the last thing I wanted to say is focus on your superpowers. Everybody's got them. Focus on your strengths. Find out what your strengths are. If, and it's helpful to use an assessment tool like the Berkman or the Strengths Finder and work with those because that will become your superpower when you combine those strengths with other things. That's how your superpower will evolve. You could have more than one superpower, but I certainly encourage you to focus on what you love doing, what you do well, and what you're passionate about. So I think that's it, Washington, from me. So we've got a few minutes for questions. And I'm happy to stay on a bit longer if anybody's got more questions to ask at the end. I, yeah, we have like a few questions in here. And thank you so much for all the information. See that you put a lot of detail in there. And uh, as you mentioned before on the chat box, we'll be uh, distributing that uh, presentation um, sometime after the event. Um, you probably like every people who sign up to the event, you receive an email with the presentation attached to it. Um, now, uh, let me check here. The first question was from, I believe it was from, just me a second, please. Um, Saru Asper, would you like to um, um, unmute yourself and answer the question? Yeah, thanks for your, thanks for your chat, Bruce. Um, yeah, it was interesting. I mean, I've similarly gone through uh, this process through the, through the Ikigai process of the four quadrants. Um, but one question where I got stumped when I was answering those four quadrants, um, the first three were easy. The last one is who will pay me for it? Now, mm. that's um, something that uh, I'm just not sure because um, I've always wanted, I work in a company currently and um, if um, there's a small part of me that wants to venture out and do something by myself, but there's all, of course that, um, that that piece that you're scared because you've got a family to support and things along those lines. So um, who might pay? Who might pay me for it? And um, yeah, and 
Um, so that's that was my one question. And the second one that would indirectly linked to it is, I there's a part of me that says you gotta have that personality to be able to go and talk to people to get a business at the same time, you know, and um, that may not necessarily be my personality, even though as much as I want to do it, you know, you, you've got to be, uh, you know, go out there and say, Hey, can you pay me for this <laughs> in right. a way? So, so let me help you with the first to answer both yeah. of those. The first question was um, who, who would pay, pay for it? it? Yeah. Now, people aren't prepared to pay you for something. That means you're just volunteering, yeah. right? But you can't, you can't pay the bills with a volunteer wage. Right. So, so you've got to find out who those people are and if they are prepared to pay for it. And this is the classic test the market scenario. So you need to find, the, find people and invite them out to lunch or a coffee and say, look, I've got this idea. How does it look to you? Would they be prepared to pay for it? You've got to do your own research. Yeah. The problem is that um, the other problem you've got, if your idea is so a bit out there, that Uber, like if I said to, like 10 years ago, if somebody said to me, would you prepare to pay for somebody to drive up to your house, pick you up in their own vehicle? I probably would have said, no, I don't want that. <laughs> so it's a little bit difficult um, when you're working in the edges of of massive change but generally you need to do your research to find out you know whether somebody would pay for it or not and, and maybe work with someone pilot it see if it would work the second question was around again you've got to go back to your strengths if your strengths is not talking to people then yeah. or you're an introvert perhaps yeah. so you focus on your strengths so when you run a company you hire the people that complement your skills. So you find a good salesperson. And I did that last year and it was one of the best things I ever did because I'm the same. I hate going to making sales calls and having coffees with people, but this guy loved it. So I think you've got to find the people that complement your skills and you work together for a common goal and you're both successful. That would really help you. And I think you don't leave your day job until you're absolutely sure that you've got something. So you've got to build it up slowly, build up your side hustles, read Dory Clark's book, or read about it, about how do you make a transition to your own business? Because in hindsight, I jumped right in. <laughs> and uh, it wasn't, uh, wasn't that pleasant. <laughs> I'm sure. But I learned a lot. So I've got a lot of scars on my back. If you want to see, I can show you all the scars. Anyone else got a question? Robert, Robert got a question. Go for it, Robert. Um, yeah, hi. I so the um, the agile, uh, yeah, the agility question you're talking about. Um, I thought it was really interesting, but also it all sounded very much skewed towards uh, leaders, and I, I I kind of get a sense that everyone today is being prepared to be a leader, which I mean clearly is destined to fail if absolutely everybody wants to be in charge so how does um how does the is there any difference in how the sort of aq concept applies to you know workers instead of leaders it doesn't as an employee and if you're not managing people you still got to scan the environment to see what's going on you still got to have humility you still got to have vision because you're your own personal brand. So the way the future work, which is here now, I shouldn't even call it future work, it's just work, is that I'm gonna, I've got a company, we need to solve this particular problem, who can solve my problem? I need six people of these different skills. I don't need leaders, I just need people who are, who are specialists in these areas. So you need to recognize, so part of being agile is recognizing those, what the lay of the land is, um, having the humility, the being adaptable, engaging with people, making good decisions. Everyone's got to do that. Uh, I get your point. The measurement is around leadership. It's a leadership program run by the business school. And that's a valid point. The concepts apply to everyone, whether you're a leader or you're running, you're actually a leader of your own business. 
which is yourself. You're a leader of your own personal brand. So unless you um, are hyper aware and seeing what's going on around you, you'll be like my dad. And then one day after 30 years, they'll just say, look, see ya, pack up your bags and go. Now it's 30 years. And it was just like that. Boom. So if you're not, see my dad didn't see it coming. So he wasn't hyper aware. So that's, everybody needs to be hyper aware, executed speed, make good decisions, engaging, visionary, adaptable and humble. Does that help? Okay, thank you. Yeah. Bruce, are you okay to, for one more question? Yeah, I, I can keep, I can stay on for another 10, 15 minutes if you want. Awesome, yeah, legend. Good uh, questions. <laughs> Tarinda, yeah. please. Hey, thanks, Washington. Uh, Bruce, thanks for taking us through this. I think there was a lot of content and uh, mm. you put a lot of effort. Also, thanks for having the link so we could go through it later. Yeah. Um, I could potentially search this later, but uh, I thought of just asking in terms of the Berk Berkman method, you yeah. mentioned that uh, it assesses you when you're under pressure and yes. when uh, without pressure as well. Yeah. Is there any frameworks it also provides in terms of help where you can improve? Oh, definitely. Um, there's 11 dimensions, but what it does is it for each of the dimensions, it it identifies what your basic needs are as an individual. What, what do I need? I need a boss who's, you know, going to let me get on with my job, right? That's one of my core needs. Um, I've got a need for autonomy. So it identifies your needs and then it, then it works where you work best in that dimension. And then the last one is how do you respond to pressure in that dimension? So as soon as I'm under pressure, um, say for example, someone wants me to make a quick decision and I can't, I can't make quick decisions. So when I'm, when I'm looking at a whole big scenario, I'm trying to work out how to improve the organization. So I'm like, okay, so I need a decision tomorrow. Well, you won't, I can't do that. And when that happens, I tend to withdraw. So I will shut down. No, I can't, I can't give you a decision. It just makes me really, really uncomfortable when I'm pressured to make a decision quickly because these are complex, deep problems. You can't make a decision in five minutes about how you're going to solve this. So, yeah, so they're the three. So let's think of it as 11 times three. You get 33 pieces of data. In fact, um, I, think I've got a, I, know, I might have mine. I thought I had it handy, but it's actually... Um, a 40 page report um and it's also got a list at the end of all the ideal career choices for you so so that would complement the gallup uh strengths finder yeah yeah gallup strength finder only costs about 40 bucks you just buy the book and you get a free assessment with it They're all very helpful yeah i've, I've done that so yeah. i just was wondering if that is uh yeah. it's complimentary yeah well Beth. the bergman usually costs somewhere between three to five hundred depending on how deep you go with the person that you're working with, or you could do coaching programs that co can cost you know, a few grand, a few thousand dollars. But um, just to do the basic assessment, 400, 500 maybe. Okay. Um, which is not cheap because the person doing the assessment has to pay for the Berkman because all the research behind it. So they're not making very much money, but it's, um, so for you, it's four to five hundred dollars. I mean, you're investing in your career. Just gives you a different perspective on on dimensions. That it's not a personality. They call it. It's not a personality assessment. It's really a career planning tool, and um, it helps you make good choices. Okay, that's what I found with it anyway. Awesome. Thanks, Bruce. Yeah. All right. We take one less. One more less questions. Uh, Mel, raise her hand. Mel, would you like to ask the question? Um, yeah. Hi. Um, thanks very much. That was really useful. Um, mm. Just sort of, I guess, two comments is um, one, I've done the Berkman as part mm. of, um, well, I was a bit lucky because I took a voluntary redundancy and it was part of the program, but um, mm. I, I definitely think that it's totally worth it. Um, mm. So, you know, whoever is in wondering, I would say definitely go and have a look at that. I think it just confirmed whatever I knew already. But I think if you feel like it's your Achilles heel, I think it it, it did have some good insights. And I guess like the second question that I had, which is really going back to your quadrants, 
um, in terms of your passion, um, what do you, what are your general thoughts about? And sorry if this sounds really negative. I think it's more the reality is that you can have something that's your passion and you really like it and it's fun, but then it might not become fun anymore if it becomes your day job that you're you know part of your one of your I guess multiple jobs that uh you know that you're that's mm. kind of paying bills and stuff just wondering what your thoughts are in terms of like you know maybe holding off on those passionate things because maybe it's just better to um you know focus on what you're you know keeping something aside just purely for fun well there's a <laughs> there's a fellow that i respected significantly and he's a an afl coach and he won numerous premierships. And he said, every day I got up, it didn't feel like I was going to work because I just loved it so much. So if it feels like work, it's not your passion. So if, you're, if you've got something you're loving now, you're probably loving something now that's taking away from something you're hating. But then if that becomes your thing, then if it just becomes work, it's just replacing one with the other, right? So I, I love doing, um, I love making uh, furniture, timber furniture. If I had to do that day in, day out, I think it would drive me crazy. But I love doing it for a release. So as a side business, I just make one off pieces and then I sell them. Yeah. If I did that all day, every day, I think I'd drive my wife nuts. Mm -hmm. And the idea is that it's about the balance. Mm -hmm. And then if you if you if you love making furniture like I do, and then you become a bit of a drag if you made the same thing. I, what I love about furniture making is every piece is unique. It's like art. But if I make the same piece twenty times, that's just boring art, you know. So I think that's yeah. You've, you only you know the answer to this question is what is it that gets you out of bed in the morning. What gets you up and going? What gets you excited about work? Mm -hmm. And um, if it gets you excited, what it means is it'll keep you keep going even when times are tough. Yeah. But if you're not excited about it, or if you're pretending you are, as soon as things get tough, they drop out. Mm -hmm. I see so many people who lo get lose their jobs, take it, become a consultant. They last for about six, 12, 18 months. And then go back and get another job because they wanted the freedom. They wanted all this thing that consulting give them, but they weren't prepared to do the hard work. Yeah. So I hope that helps. Does that? No, no, it's, it's, yeah. it's helpful because I, I always, um, yeah. I kind of always ask that question because I guess my dad had some really interesting insights as to that. Yeah. And sometimes I share that with, um, mentees yeah. that I, I mentor because you know mm. like maybe they're young and they're looking for their life passion or their goal mm. and I think one of the things that my dad did say to me was don't do something that when it becomes your day job you just it just kills your passion um, and then I think sometimes my dad's other thing that he said to me was mm. oh well sometimes like things that are passion might not make money but if you get a job that you don't mind and you don't hate mm. you can pay for your passion on That's the side yeah. um but i'm always interested mm. in like other people's perspectives because some of that mm. feedback that i've gotten in the past is oh your dad's so like so dismal i, I just want to look for my passion and i said well mm. like there's a reality right like yeah. maybe when you're young and you don't have a mortgage and you don't have need to put food on the table it's a little bit different yeah. um but I, i'm always yeah. interested in those perspectives yeah. because like you're trying to find something that you don't hate um well, the, the other way to look at it is, is like this. Not every job is perfect. It's got to be perfect to what you want. And there's a thing called an SH, SHT sandwich. You know what I'm talking about? So everybody's got to eat an SHT sandwich every now and then, right? You might as well have some peanut butter on it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So... So by having the side stuff, that, that fills your heart with joy. So that when the SHHT sandwich comes along, you just put a bit of mayo on it and uh, yeah. enjoy it because 
-hmm. you might as well enjoy it because yeah. you've got to put up with it to get the other stuff. And yeah. money's a necessary evil. You can't avoid yeah. it. You've got to pay bills. You've got to bring up kids. You've got to pay school fees, all that stuff. And you can't do that without an income. We'd all love to be, you know, uh, having uh, generating income from what we're passionate about, but the world's not prepared to pay for it. I do a lot of work in the not-for-profit not sector and I see they could be so much better off if they had some good consulting, they could improve their processes, they wouldn't have to spend very much to do it, but they don't want to spend anything because mm -hmm. they believe that we're a not-for-profit and we shouldn't spend money to make money. We should mm -hmm. just not spend money at all. So yeah. even though I see I can help them, but a lot of them are not um, open to the help. Yeah. You know, cool. I can see the pain. I can see that I can see where I can help them. But if they don't want to be helped, then we've just got to move on. So you've got mm -hmm. to find someone who does want to be helped. And that's the person who's prepared to pay you for what you do. Okay, cool. Journey. Thank you. Just a journey. Yes. There's no destination. No end game. You just keep adapting, evolving, learning as you go. Right. Well, thank you. Hope that helps. No, that helps. Thank you. Anything else, Washington? Um, that will be it for the questions. And yeah. thank you so much, Bruce. Thank you so much for your time today, uh, yeah. for your wisdom, and then for the great material you prepared for us. Yeah. Um, uh, with that, uh, we'll be concluding our uh, event for tonight. Um, thank you so much for the people who has uh, completed the uh, uh, the feedback, um, and then uh, also find us on our social media uh, link here on the chat below. And um, stay tuned for the next event on April twenty eighth. Uh, we have uh, Tony Corney speaking on "Be Your Best Self in Times of Uncertainty and Pressure." And with that, uh, thank you so much, everybody. I hope you have a lovely weekend ahead. And please, uh, yes, enjoy, enjoy the fullest of life. Thanks, guys. See everybody. Feel free to connect.